Hello everyone. Once again, this is Pastor Terry Reese of the Valley Grace Brethren Church of Armall, Pennsylvania. And as always, it is a great privilege to have you with us for the broadcast. We're continuing in our studies on the four states of man. Uh, we, we are discussing the fact that uh, there are four states in which human beings have been or are or will be found. And these four states are as follows. First of all, the state of innocence or primitive integrity. Uh, this is the state of mankind in its innocency before the fall. Uh, only Adam and Eve enjoyed this state, but it was a state of, as Bo Thomas Boston puts it, primitive integrity. Man was sound. He had integrity. Uh, he had it together. He was created in a state of perfection, a state of legitimate holiness. However, it was an unconfirmed, untested holiness, a probationary state. Man had the capacity to obey the commands of God or disobey, disobey the commands of God. And uh, sadly, he chose the latter and thus lapsed into the state of sin or the state of nature which is the state we will be discussing today. It is the state of natural man after the fall, a state of uh, misery, a state of sinfulness, a state of natural inability. Happily, however, there is a third state, the state of grace or begun recovery. This is the state of the, the Christian man, the regenerate man, the man with a new heart, uh, the man to whom God's grace, effectual grace, has been extended. However, this man, uh, despite the fact that he can indeed uh, produce those fruits in accordance with repentance and uh, extend uh, faith, uh, he uh, nonetheless is a man still uh, in a state of warfare. He still has the... Uh, um, uh, the, the vestiges of the old nature within him, and this struggle with the sin nature will continue, this struggle with the flesh, until this point when he puts on uh, the, the fourth state, the happy state of glory, what we call the state of consummate happiness. This is the eternal state of glorified man. Man freed from his capacity to sin. Uh, man no longer struggling with the sin nature, the eternal state for the Christian. But right now, again, we're talking about the second and most miserable of these states, the state of nature or the state of sin. And uh, the, I can scarcely think of a topic more important or more relevant for us in our present uh, condition. This is a universal problem. All men are born in this state, ravaged uh, by, the, uh, uh, by Adam's fall, ravaged in terms of the fact that uh, uh, we have lost our original innocence, our primitive integrity, and now exist in a state of sin, what has become for us, sadly, the state of nature. The Apostle Paul speaks of the universality of this problem, in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, listen to Paul's powerful language. As it is written, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You notice the universal nature of Paul's language. He's talking about man as he comes into this world in his natural condition, untouched by the effectual grace of God. This is man's universal problem, and only God has the solution for that problem. Uh, God must initiate a relationship between himself and ourselves. Uh, natural man, as Paul also talks about in 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, he is a man uh, who cannot 
apprehend the spiritual truth. And this is not an intellectual problem. This is a spiritual problem, a heart problem. This man is spiritually dead, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, by nature, he is a son of disobedience. Uh, that is, he is a son of fallen Adam. This is our problem. This is the world's great problem. This is why uh, there are wars, and this is why there are tragedies, big and small, why you have your neighborhood bandit, and why you have uh, 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 world empires that are fierce and cruel. Both our big pro social problems and our little social problems are all traced back to our miserable origins, to this root of sin that is within us. You know, when we, we think about uh, this, uh, the universality of this, I would remind you again of uh, King David's lament, the universal lament, Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And that, let's not misunderstand David here. He's not uh, talking about his mother being a, an immoral woman. He's talking about the fact that he, David, had a sin nature from conception, from the moment he came into existence, even before birth, even while within his mother's womb, he had this sin nature. It's always been a part of him. It is his natural fallen condition. This is why, again, there's no utopian solutions for the human race. I know our politics today, our progressive politics, likes to deceive us with such notions that our only problem is that we don't have enough tax dollars going to education or to government programs, all these things. But the fact is, friends, there is no utopia coming until our Lord Jesus Christ appears. Um, because of this uh, root of sin, this sin nature that is within all of us, uh, utopian solutions, progressive solutions, when, when applied, in fact, are incompetent and indeed even dangerous. Uh, it is to our peril when we ignore what God says concerning our true natures. It's also very important that we discuss this matter of human, uh, the human sin nature. Uh, and uh, if we don't have a clear understanding of these things, uh, we will have incorrect views uh, with regard to uh, what God does in salvation. We will tend to rob God of his glory he who has initiated this, uh, any sort of personal redemptive relationship between ourselves and himself. Um, if we don't understand the depths of the sin problem that natural man has, we will tend to not only rob God of his glory, but we will also exalt human capacity, and this is deeply offensive to God. We're robbing God of his glory and making ourselves our own saviors. And uh, in the end, uh, I think also this uh, a false understanding of human nature will serve as an impediment to evangelism. We'll engage in strategies that are unbiblical because we don't understand the nature of natural man. And in fact, I think we'll be... Uh, We'll, we'll be slow to prayer because, you know, we, if we understand just how great uh, the depth of human depravity is, we will be praying all the more fervent, fervently for our fellow man because, uh, in the end, the only thing that can overcome human total depravity is the grace of God, that God himself would heroically intervene in the lives of our friends, in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our next door neighbors. Friends, we need the power of God with regard to human salvation. Um, talking about this matter of the, uh, of the state of nature or the, uh, the state of sin, as I said, there are three aspects to this that we wish to explore over the coming weeks. 
One, the, uh, the sinfulness of this natural state, which we'll be looking at today. Two, the misery of man's natural state. And thirdly, the inability, the natural inability of man in this state. This week, I want to look, uh, as I look at the sinfulness of this state, I want to be, uh, begin looking at uh, two key terms that you often hear, but perhaps some of you don't have a clear understanding of. The terms original sin and total depravity. Um, this week, we're only going to be talking about original sin. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the term total depravity. But this, uh, this term, original sin, again, uh, I know it's one that we've all heard of, but I wonder how many of us can, if pressed, can give a clear definition of what that term means. That key term that is, uh, has become so central to uh, the development of Western historical theology. Um, first of all, this term, original sin. Uh, the term is not found in the Bible. Um, actually, it is a term that was coined by the great 4th and 5th century theologian, uh, Augustine of Hippo. But even though the, t the, the term itself is not scriptural, certainly the concept is scriptural. And that's, uh, that's really all that is important. You know, the uh, various cults will say, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the term Trinity is not found in the Bible. That, and that is true. That term is never found in the Bible. However, the concept definitely is scriptural. This is a possible, this is a, uh, you know, something, uh, whether it be the Jehovah's Witnesses who are non-Trinitarian, whether it be the Mormons, whether it be the, uh, the Oneness Pentecostals, uh, um, these, all of these groups uh, oppose the doctrine of the Trinity, and all of them are very quick to say, uh, you know, that word is not in the Bible. True. Uh, it was Tertullian who coined that word. Uh, but nonetheless, the concept, the concept is indeed scriptural. This is the only, uh, uh, the only God that the word of God presents us with, a God who is triune. So, again, uh, the same is true with the term original sin. True, the word, the, the phrase original sin is not in the Bible, but certainly that concept is very scriptural. I want to define the concept today. It's very important you have an understanding of what we mean when we use this phrase. The, uh, the phrase original sin, I want to run several uh, definitions by you. Um, here's one from the Moody Handbook of Theology. Uh, original sin refers to the sinful state and condition in which men are born. Okay, stop there for a moment. So it's referring to the state and condition in which men are, bo men are born. Um, secondly, um, uh, it goes on to say, sin is, number one, derived from, derived from the original root of the human race, Adam. Two, it is present in every individual from conception. And three, it is the root of all actual sins that defile a man. So let's just break that down again for you. Um, it refers to our sinful state and condition. Okay, so it's not referring specifically uh, to, or primarily to Adam's first sin, that sin that he, he and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. Rather, it is referring to the results of that first sin, which is the corruption of the human race. Um, it, is, uh, it is that sinful state and condition into which men are born. Um, now, it is derived, as this uh, definition from Paul ends, from the, the Moody Handbook of Theology makes clear, from the original root of the human race, that is, our father Adam, true enough. But again, it refers to the state or condition which we inherit from him. 
Uh, the definition, again, makes it clear that uh, every individual from conception, uh, has, that this uh, sinful state and condition is present within us. Um, so there's no exceptions to this, except, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, um, who is uh, free from original sin, who was virgin born, and who, uh, though true man, also tr joined to a divine nature, um, but every other human being uh, has the, is born in this sinful state and condition. So it's universal. And uh, thirdly, it is the root of all actual sins that you commit in your life that further defile you. So you're born in this sinful state and condition. And because of that, uh, all the other sins that you commit through your life uh, are produced. Uh, they are born of that sinful produced or born of that sinful tree. Uh, they, uh, uh, they grow out of that, or, that original root of sinfulness. So again, this, I think this is a pretty extensive uh, definition that touches the bases. Um, another source, uh, an internet source called Theopedia, I think uh, provided a pretty good definition. It says, quote, original sin is the doctrine which holds that human nature has been morally and ethically corrupted due to the disobedience of mankind's first parents to the revealed will of God. So again, it emphasizes that it is uh, the sinful state and condition that we're born into because of Adam. It goes on to say, the doctrine of original sin holds that every person born into the world is tainted by the fall in such, uh, in, in such that all of humanity is ethically debilitated and people are powerless to rehabilitate themselves unless rescued by God. So as we look at this definition, it underlines not only the fact that uh, original sin is this sinful state and condition in which we're born, but it makes it clear that... Um, uh, it is universal. Every person born in the world has, is tainted in this way. And it, is, it underlines the fact, this definition does, that it is debilitating, that uh, it is indeed a state of natural inability. It produces a state of natural inability. We cannot rehabilitate ourselves. Salvation must be initiated by the power of God Almighty, the great rescuer and redeemer, who condescends and reaches down and saves people, changes their hearts so that they can indeed um, receive our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a debilitating state. And... Um, I'll leave you with one more definition because it's a classical one. It says much the same thing as uh, the other two that I've read, but uh, I would feel somewhat remiss if I did not read from the classical Westminster Confession, one of the greatest confessions of the historic Christian faith coming from the year of our Lord, 1647 in England, the English Puritans, uh, an assembly of Puritan divines or theologians put together this Westminster Confession and the Westminster uh, uh, Shorter Catechism, uh, these uh, classic uh, teaching devices. And uh, indeed, uh, then when the Baptists later devised their own statement of faith, they, they basically took the Westminster Confession and readapted it uh, to conform to their own understanding of the ordinances, a belief in adult or believer's baptism and a baptism by immersion. But um, nonetheless, when it comes to the doctrine of man and predestination and the doctrine of sin, um, they follow the, the, uh, the essential wording of the, West, the historic Westminster Confession. But the Westminster Confession in uh, um, Article 6, uh, Point one says this, um, quote, by this sin they, that is Adam and Eve, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all parts and faculties of soul and body. 
they being the, the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. And the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed to all actual transgressions. Let me break that down, because that really, that says a lot. It speaks of our spiritual death, uh, the result of Adam and Eve's uh, sin, and this death uh, being passed on to us. Again, it sounds a lot like uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, which speaks of us uh, being spiritually dead in terms of our natures. Um, um, uh, that we are, uh, you know, by nature, uh, children of disobedience. Um, but um, we are wholly defiled in all parts and faculties of soul and body. This is speaking of our total depravity, that uh, the results of the fall are total, that they have extended to every part of our being, our mind, our soul, body, um, just to every aspect of our personhood is tainted by this sin. And um, Adam and Eve, of course, the root of all mankind, uh, their sin is both imputed, or that is reckoned unto us, that is, we sinned in them, in the garden, and the penalties of this sin have been uh, transmitted to us. Um, uh, and uh, we also, not only are we dealing with imputed sin, but inherited sin. We inherit their sin nature through natural regeneration. And, uh, we are the children of Adam and Eve, and uh, their, uh, uh, their corrupt nature being passed on to us. And uh, we, um, we are thus in a state where we are helpless in our sin as we come into the world and must be rescued by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, by the power of God, who alone is able to regenerate our dead, spiritually dead, not sick, dead hearts. And this, uh, this natural uh, sin nature, um, from this proceeds all of the personal sins which we commit throughout our lives. Now, um, Having uh, I pretty exhaustively, I hope, uh, defined this, that you understand what we mean by this key uh, concept, I would, uh, I would just give you a little bit of a historical background here. Um, the, uh, the definition that I have given you is the classic Reformed view coming out of the Reformation, um, certainly agreeable to historic Calvinist theology. This is the correct view of original sin. It is correct with regard to, our, biblically correct, with regard to our relationship to Adam, and it affirms uh, both uh, the inherited and imputed nature of our sin. Um, Adam's sin is our sin, and Adam's corrupt nature has been passed on down to us. And, uh, well, that is the correct view, that is the biblical view. Sadly, that is not the only view. Um, you think about some of these other religions that claim adherence to uh, uh, the original Abrahamic monotheism. Uh, you think about uh, Judaism and Islam. Both of these world religions, which claim uh, Abrahamic origins, uh, nonetheless deny this uh, concept of original sin as we explain it. They do agree that um, man is born into a sinful environment, but they deny the principles of inherited guilt and the, uh, the, the concept of the essential corruption of man's nature, that man is born in a state of sin, conceived in a state of sin. 
Uh, they simply deny the concept of original sin. Yes, you are born into a corrupt environment, and that affects you. Uh, you uh, you're influenced by that environment, but you're not really born with a sin nature, so to speak. Um, of course, that when you think about that, that kind of begs the question, doesn't it? How did we get born into a corrupt, sinful environment if original sin is not true? Where did that sin come from in the first place? Well, because human beings are conceived in sin. That's why we have a sinful environment. So it won't do just to say we're born into a sinful environment, uh, a sinful world, and that negatively affects us. As we learn uh, from the world, it's crooked ways. It, it goes deeper than that. We have a sinful environment, yes, because men are by nature Sinners. Of course, the cultic societies, uh, they, they join with rabbinic Judaism and Islam in rejecting the idea of original sin. They, uh, groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the, uh, uh, the Mormons, they tend to uh, embrace an idea called Pelagianism. This is named after the famous theologian Pelagius, who was a contemporary and a theological enemy of uh, Augustine. Um, Pelagius believed in absolute human free will. Uh, he believed he was a fanatic with regard to the concept of free will. He simply would not entertain the idea that man is born with an infected uh, nature, a sin nature. Um, he, uh, he thought it was theoretically possible that a person could live a sinless life. He says, after all, doesn't, uh, uh, didn't Jesus uh, say, uh, Matthew 5, 48, in the Sermon on the Mount, be ye perfect, even as my heavenly Father is perfect? If Jesus commanded it, he would be unjust. If we didn't have the potentiality to actually be perfect, but, uh, friends, I would say, simply say this in response. Do you know any perfect people? Uh, if what Pelagius is saying is true, why is it that the world has only ever produced one perfect person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a unique case? But the, the cults have this Pelagian idea, which has been denounced by all branches of historic Christianity, um, all branches of what we call historic uh, Christianity, the historic denominations, while they uh, do not necessarily uh, agree on what original sin is, at least will acknowledge that Adam was in some way affected by uh, this, uh, this original act of uh, rebellion and that this has, this results of this have been passed on to his progeny. Of course, uh, modern infidelity, uh, your modern radical liberal uh, denominations, and of course, uh, when we're speaking of infidelity, uh, the materialistic world, the atheist world, the skeptical world, the, uh, the world of humanism, all of these uh, movements reject the idea of original sin. They all seek to perfect mankind through natural means. Of course, when you think about uh, the liberal denominations, because of their rejection of original sin they, in the uh, late 1800s and the early 1900s, they got into this social gospel where they would per, uh, perfect society through moral instruction and so forth. Um, now, when you think about original sin, it is, an, as I said, it's an anchor of historic, uh, Christian theology, more particularly Western theology, which was more under the influence of Augustine. Um, Roman Catholicism, indeed, does affirm original sin. However, there are some distortions there. It sadly sees water baptism as the cure uh, for original sin, although even after baptism, the uh, tendency to sin yet remains. But nonetheless, Roman Catholicism does have a, although defective, concept of original sin. Uh, something similar, perhaps, could be said of Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, its 
view of original sin is uh, somewhat softer and less satisfying than even Roman Catholicism's. Uh, it, it's comfortable speaking of ancestral sin, um, but it generally does not employ the term original sin. It uh, chooses uh, to focus uh, on the idea that we have inherited the consequences, the consequences of Adam's sin, rather than the idea that we have uh, an inherited guilt. Um, so Eastern Orthodoxy does, does affirm that Adam's sin has affected us, but in, uh, not really in the biblical sense, so as the Reformed churches uh, teach. Um, then there's Arminianism. Now, uh, this, uh, this is a branch of Protestant, historical Protestant theology that does, in principle, affirm the concept of original sin. However, unfortunately, it mutes that teaching uh, because in, in the sense that it has this theory that it calls prevenient grace. The idea is that God has universally partially rolled back the effects of original sin to the extent that man is capable of a uh, free will faith response. Uh, uh, the idea is that um, the Arminian theology uh, does not wish to see the effects of original sin as debilitating as Reformed theology does. So it has created this, um, this view called prevenient grace that says that all men are partially regenerated, partially born again, uh, to the extent that, uh, that the, the full effects of original sin have been rolled back, that we're not really spiritually dead anymore, and that... Uh, uh, that um, all men thus uh, have this uh, legitimate free will, and thus, if you make a uh, faith decision, it's because uh, uh, it's because of your own power. Um, this is uh, somewhat different than the Reformed view, which holds that we come into the world spiritually dead. And by the way, there is no biblical passage that teaches prevenient grace. That's something they made up. Um, the, uh, the, the Reformed view, though, is that all men come into the world spiritually dead and that God uh, effectively uh, uh, brings us uh, redemption uh, or effectively bestows his grace upon us, upon a particular portion of the human race through the regeneration of their hearts. And then when a person's uh, heart has been thus touched by the powerful grace of God, that person freely makes a faith decision in the Lord Jesus Christ in accordance with his regenerate nature. Uh, we would argue that that reform view is the correct view and uh, indeed uh, embraces in its fullness the doctrine of original sin. Um, this, this doctrine of original sin, it's been argued against, it's been diluted, it's been minimized, uh, and yet, you know, when you think about it, there is no doctrine that is as uh, uniquely demonstrable in the real world, in terms of real world evidence, as this doctrine, the doctrine of original sin. Uh, G.K. Chesterton was a great wit, a British author of the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and he argued that this doctrine is the one Christian doctrine that is both empirically verifiable, it's scientifically verifiable, and it is scientifically validated and historically validated by the last 3,500 years of human history. All you have to do is analyze human history, and you can see the evidence. Chesterton writes in his book, Orthodoxy, chapter 2, he writes, Certain new theologians dispute original sin, which, which 
he says, is the only part of Christian theology which can really be proved. You know, you can't prove uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, by looking at a test tube or even looking at a cloud or nature. Uh, we have to rely on uh, special revelation, the word of God. But this, uh, this doctrine of original sin, you just to look at nature, you ought to be able to see it. Um, Here's, uh, here's some of the ways in which this doctrine is uh, verifiable. Um, first of all, uh, you know, we always hear that men are basically good. But if that's true, why do we have this manifold witness of the following crises upon us? Number one, universal misery. This planet is covered in universal misery from one end of the globe to the other. The four corners of the world are four corners of misery. Broken homes, addictions, immorality, deception, theft, all manner of crime, corruption, incompetence, hurt feelings, you name it. Misery is universal. Show me an area of life in which, which is not broken by misery and sin. Is this not ample evidence for the doctrine of original sin? Um, number two, consider the witness of human savagery. The history of this planet is written in what? Not in ink, but in blood. Whether you're dealing with genocides, savage wars, even in the uh, the most so-called civilized eras, you know we've had the uh, the worst genocides in human history, the the genocide of the Nazis, or you know places like Rwanda or the Armenian um, uh, genocide, one genocide after another, people attempting to exterminate other races of human beings. Wars, uh, in this, this modern civilized age, the 20th century, two of the bloodiest wars in the history of the world. World War I, then World War II, a global war nonetheless, ending in an atomic explosion. Universal savagery from the beginning of our history to the end, the ancient world the rise and fall of one empire after another that was built on savagery, bloodshed. That's the nature of human history. Number three, another manifold witness of the fact that this uh, doctrine of original sin is true. Um, we see the presence of evil even amongst the youngest amongst us. It's the one thing you never have to teach a child. It just becomes natural. Last, last week's message, I talked about the depravity of two 10-year-old boys who murdered a 2-year-old in England back in 1993. Where does such evil come from? How, do, how is it that evil develops in the heart of a child? The answer is, it's always been there from the moment of conception. The most intense evil often found in the hearts of even the very young. Why are children so cruel, so cruel to one another at a time when you would think that you know, children should be innocent, and yet there's such cruelty, such uh, belittling of one another, such uh, t teasing one another, resistance to authority. Where does it come from? It's always been there from the moment they were conceived. Another aspect, another witness of how of this of this the universality of this depravity. Um, we always need laws, don't we, to guard our uh, the peace of our society. You know, today this is one of our big problems. Uh, since 2020, it seems like our governments and our big cities and our states and our country in general. Uh, uh, we, we have not been zealously enforcing the law. We've allowed uh, young people to uh, do uh, crazy things, these smash and grab rob uh, robberies and these riots, uh, just utter lawlessness without uh, 
any punitive response. You saw the riots of 2020. Uh, how many people were actually punished uh, because of these, these riots? Revolving door justice. And you see the result. Uh, the softer uh, law uh, enforcement appears, and our courts appear, and the punishments appear, uh, the greater the tendency of people to break the law. Yeah, I think it was out in California where they were saying you can get away with uh, stealing up to nine hundred ninety-nine dollars worth of emergency of uh, or worth worth of merchandise, and you won't be prosecuted. So, what's the result of that? People steal up to $999 worth of merchandise. Friends, just the fact that we need laws, just the fact that we need police, just the fact that we need severe punishments and courts is a demonstration of the fact, not the theory, the fact of original sin, the universality of the sin nature. It's a proven Fact. Another area in which we see the manifold witness of human uh, depravity and uh, original sin, uh, we've already mentioned this, the universal failure of all utopian schemes and uh, so-called utopian communities, whether it be the Oneida community, the Shakers, the New Harmony uh, sect. Um, the only place that uh, utopia works is in science fiction stories. In the real world, you know, it never works. Again, I'll remind you of that wonderful quote from the Oxford historian uh, Herbert Butterfield. I mentioned this in our last message. It's worth repeating. He says, quote, what history does is to uncover man's universal sin. We create tragedy after tragedy for ourselves by a lazy, unexamined doctrine of man which is current amongst us and which the study of history does not support." Unquote. Another example of the universal evidence for um, this uh, original sin, um, no, not only can no human society achieve perfection, but not even a Christian society. Uh, think about the, the, the remnants of corruption that are evident even within the lives of the saints. We as Christians know to what depths we can fall. Think about your own local church. Think about its history over the last 30 years. Has everything been peachy keen? Has everyone gotten along? Have there been no radical business meetings that have brought shame and contempt to the church? Have people not left the church because of hurt feelings? Because someone damaged them? Of course, you know the answer to that. The fact is, our churches have all kinds of problems because we still have this sin nature within us. Is that not evidence that even within a so-called regenerate society, the church, that you still see sin. You still see the evidence of original sin. Um, lastly, I would point to this evidence you know, of original sin. Note the general irrationality of how most men live their lives. Most men live as madmen. You know, Jesus tells us that the, uh, the majority report in this world is that most men are lost. They are pursuing the, uh, the broad road rather than the narrow gate, Matthew 7. Men, most men, live as though they are completely insane. God has provided a way of salvation that simply uh, involves turning in trust to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that did the heavy lifting. He died for our sins. Uh, he's the one who took the, uh, the wrath of the Father upon himself. He became the God-forsaken one. He simply asks that men turn to him in trust, accept his truth claims that he is who he claims to be, God come in the flesh who has died for our sins. And uh, 
Men uh, reject that, uh, that simple salvation and pursue other schemes, worthless schemes. Men uh, act as though they will live forever and that there will be no consequences for their sins. Rather than turning to God in repentance, they live as though there is no God. Think about Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1. You know, they both say the same thing. Men say in their hearts, there is no God. This is dealing more with practical atheism than intellectual atheism. It's not so much that men are making a definitive um, intellectual assertion or philosophical assertion, there's no God. Rather, they're living as though there's no God. Maybe academically they believe there's a God, but they're living as though they will never be held to account. That is what we call practical atheism. Men are living as deranged madmen. I see elderly politicians even in this country who are in their 80s living as though they will never face God in, ju in judgment. I think about our president. Uh, here's a man who's, uh, what, about 80 years old. He's soon going to be facing God in judgment. Uh, surely you would think it would occur to him, it would occur to him, He's not going to live much longer. He's old. And yet he continues to support the wanton destruction of human life. I'm talking about the filth of abortion. He uh, continues to uh, champion the, uh, the, uh, the uh, champion the uh, uh, debasement of marriage. He continues to champion of the, the uh, suppression of Christians to live in accordance with their, their, uh, their conscience. You know, all these leftists uh, want to use the laws, civil rights laws, to uh, uh, prevent Christians from operating their businesses in accordance with the dictates of their consciences. These people are living as though they will live forever and never face God in judgment. Madmen. I don't know how else to describe them. I don't know how else to describe our president other than as a madman. Here's a man who claims to be a Roman Catholic, thus claims to believe in the, that marriage is a holy sacrament, and yet as vice president of the United States under Obama, nonetheless officiated over a gay wedding. This, friends, is a madman living as though there is no God. Is this not the evidence of original sin? Is this not the evidence that Chesterton is pointing to? Well, if there's anything, any doctrine we should believe, is what we're saying. It's the doctrine of original sin. And unfortunately, this is the gift that goes on giving. Adam gave us a quote-unquote gift. The gift he pass, is passed on to us his sin nature, he inherited death, and now he's passed it on to uh, his progeny. He, uh, he lost all ability to save himself, and, uh, as, uh, uh, and corruption spread to every aspect of his own being, and now he's passed all of this on to his own children. Um, we read in uh, Genesis chapter 5, that's a remarkable chapter, uh, that God created Adam in his own likeness and image. You know, Adam was created to reflect the glory of his creator. Um, but sadly, Adam fell, and that image, though not completely destroyed, was certainly broken, distorted, shattered. And we read in Genesis 5, 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. So, unfortunately, Seth, uh, we re as we learn, was not uh, uh, is not so is not in the perfect is not uh, in the perfect image of Adam creation, but rather he's uh, he was. He was uh, born in the image and likeness of a corrupt Adam, a fallen Adam. Adam's sin nature trans, uh, translated onto him, or transmitted onto him. 
And uh, Seth lives a certain number of years, and like Adam, he dies. You know, Adam died immediately in the Garden of Eden in the spiritual sense, and the day you eat it, you will die. And the, But to, in the physical sense, he did live another 930 years, but in the end, Adam did die. And his son, who inherited his sin nature, Seth, eventually he dies too. He lives for centuries. Men lived about 900 years during this period uh, before the flood, but they all died. And you read that Genesis 5, it sounds like the tolling of a bell. You read over and over again. He lived such, a, such years, he had a son, and then uh, he lived uh, to a certain age, and then he died, and he died. And he died, and he died, like a tolling of a death knell throughout that chapter, Genesis 5. Yes, these men were more robust than we are, more vigorous than we are today. They lived 900 or more years, but in the end, they all died. And uh, that is, again, the evidence of uh, original sin, uh, the sin nature being passed on. Uh, Job says this, an ancient man who lived during the time of Abraham, about 4,000 years ago, Job 14.4, he says to God, uh, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. See, Job here is looking for some mercy, and he's trying to make the point to God, who is infinite and perfect, uh, now why judge me so harshly? After all, I, I was born the son of a sinner. I'm a sinner myself as a result of that. You see, Job understood this idea of original sin. Uh, even back in the, the, those early days, in patriarchal times, there was this concept of the sin nature, of original sin, and uh, the, the Job is appealing to that so the, in the hopes that God will soften his punitive blow. You know, uh, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? I can't help that I'm unclean. That's what he's saying. There is not one. And then, of course, so Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Note that, not just sick like the Arminians say, but dead like the uh, biblical reformed Calvinist view would have it. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, that's the devil, by the way, in the sons of disobedience. You know, we are sons of disobedience. We are sons of Adam. And he goes on, <clears throat> verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. What does he say about natural man? By nature, children of wrath. It says it's all, by nature, by nature, children of wrath. We were not born neutral. Uh, we were not born with clean dispositions like the cults and like Islam and Judaism would have it or liberal Protestantism would have it. By nature, children of wrath, sons of disobedience, dead in trespasses and sins, Paul says all that in three verses, in just three verses, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. But we're slow to believe it because it's counterintuitive. We don't want to believe it. We don't like to believe it. Most of us are not being guided by Scripture, uh, sola scriptura, the Scriptures alone. We're being guided by sola cardia, the heart alone. Where is your authority, my friends? The Bible's very clear on this. We are born in a state of original sin and total depravity, period. Okay? I know the, uh, ooh, that reformed Calvinistic view, ooh, I don't like that. And yet the, the Bible teaches it. Case closed. Um, but, you know, you think about this matter of, of human beings. All these verses that I just read make the point that men fell as a unit. Not like the angels who have no parents and who thus fell as individuals. We fell through the sin of one, Adam. One man fell and the whole race fell with him. That's because we are in Adam. It's like the relationship of 
Levi to his great grandfather um, uh, Abraham, as described in Hebrew seven. Uh, that talks about how Levi uh, paid taxes to a man before he was even born, Melchizedek, because he was in Abraham, or excuse me, pay, paid tithes unto Melchizedek. He was in his father, in the same way we are in Adam. And thus Romans 5, 12 tells us that all, because one man sinned, all sinned. Adam sinned, thus you sinned. And I know uh, you'll say, well, I don't feel like I should be held responsible for another man's sin. Again, friends, uh, you're following sola cardia rather than sola scriptura. The scripture's plain, Romans 5. One man sinned, thus all sinned. Period. That's all I need to know. I don't need any other explanations. God said it, that settles it. The end. Um, but think about that verse, Romans, or Job 14, 4, that I want to sort of wrap up on, where Job, uh, again, in his complaint to God or his appeal for mercy, uh, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. Um, as Albert Barnes, in his great old commentary, uh, makes it plain, you know, this is an obvious truth, what Job is stating here. And the obvious tru truth, I'll just quote Barnes here, like will beget like over all the world. Okay, stop and think about that. He's saying like will beget like. That's the principle that's here. Um, he goes on, the nature of the lion, the tiger, the hyena, the serpent is propagated. And so the same thing is true of man. It is a great law that the offspring will resemble the parentage. And as the offspring of the lion is not a lamb, but a young lion, of a wolf is not a kid, but a young wolf. So the offspring of man is not an angel, but is a man with the same nature and the same moral character, the same proneness to evil with the parent. Barnes goes on, as a historical record, as a historical record this passage proves that the doctrine of original sin was early held in the world. In other words, he's saying, look, Job lived 4,000 years ago. He knew this. And he goes on to say, still it is true that the same great law prevails, that the offspring of woman is a sinner, no matter where he may be born or in what circumstances he may be placed. No art, no philosophy, no system of religion can prevent the operation of this great law under which we live and by which we die. I love those words by Albert Barnes. Now you see why his commentary has uh, just been popular for uh, many, many uh, uh, years. And it's, by the way, is one of those uh, public domain reference works. That if you download a Bible program, usually you'll get uh, the Barnes program, uh, his commentary on the scriptures for free. And I, I use Albert Barnes uh, quite a bit. He just has a way of expressing things like you, like you see here uh, with such pith and uh, indeed uh, with such clarity. And, uh, uh, but uh, what he's saying, you know, um, it, it should remind us of what our Lord Jesus Christ says to us. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 18. He's talking about false prophets and he says, you'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor fig figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Unquote. Okay, again, that's our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. That's not some theologian. That's not Abe Lincoln. That's the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the word of God, the, uh, the source of truth. 
he's again making the point. You don't go, when you want to pick grapes, where do you go? You go to a, a vine. You don't go to a thistle bush. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't go to, when you want to pick figs, you go to the fig tree. You don't go to, uh, you don't go to someplace else like a thistle bush, do you? Right? And, uh, you know, it's the same thing as what Barnes was saying with the uh, uh, wolves don't give birth to uh, lambs, right? And uh, lions don't give bir birth to little peeps, or little chickens. They give birth to lions. And the same is true here. And, uh, you know, this applies to our, uh, our fruit, our spiritual fruit. This is why unregenerates cannot initiate a faith response unto God. Um, they are the bad tree. They are unregenerate. Uh, they cannot bear fruit in accordance with repentance. On the other hand, a regenerate tree can produce fruit in accordance with repentance. The tree produces the fruit. And I like J.I. Packer's uh, uh, commentary on this. He says, the assertion of original sin makes the point that we are not sinners because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners, born with a nature enslaved to sin, unquote. So uh, again, it's uh, again the, um, the salient part here. We're not sinners because we sin. Rather, we sin because we're sinners. The tree produces the fruit, not vice versa. By the way, speaking of J.I. Packer, his book, Knowing God, is one of the great modern classics. If you haven't read it yet, I certainly encourage you to do so. Two more quotes here, and we'll be done. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of Baptist preachers, a great Calvinistic Baptist preacher, he said, The venom of sin is the very fountain of our being. It has poisoned our heart. It is in the very marrow of our bones and is as natural to us as anything that belongs to us. Finally, G.K. Chesterton. Boy, if there's anybody that's quotable, it's Chesterton. And he, he's talking about the great ills uh, that uh, fill the world, you know, and he's the one who was talking about how if anything is provable, it's original sin. Just look at the history of the world. And he's talking about, um, you know, why is the world in such a mess that it is? He says, quote, what is wrong with the world? I am. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful quote that is. You know, I still have the root of sin within me. I still have a sin nature. I'm what's wrong with the world. And that's the truth. Fortunately, Lord Jesus Christ has the solution. He's able to reach down, rescue people, uh, affect pour out upon them his efficacious grace. The older theologians called it irresistible grace, but I like the term effectual grace, or perhaps better. He's able to reach down and regenerate a dead heart, replace a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And uh, that is, uh, he's able to begin recovery. Um, he's able to raise the dead. And that makes him the one who deserves all the credit for our salvation. The reason, friends, we've been so uh, hard on this point is, I think in the modern church, uh, which is so tinged with Arminianism, we are robbing God of his glory and redemption. He alone deserves all the credit in redemption. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God and not of works, lest no man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I wonder, are we really preaching that anymore in the modern neo-evangelical church, or have we somewhat debased that uh, by trying to get, sneak some degree of credit here that through our strength uh, we're entitled to a little bit of boasting with regard to our salvation? Friends, we need to emphasize the radical the spiritual death of humanity in Adam so that God may be properly glorified as our one and only Savior, our one and only Redeemer. To him belongs the glory alone. Sola Deo Gloria. To God be the glory alone.
Well, until next time, friends, this is uh, Pastor Terry Reese. And until next time, uh, may the grace of our God be with you. We'll see you next time.